Thank you. Uh, let me start by saying hello to everybody here and to all our audiences throughout Europe. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be a guest of the University of Cologne. Thank you very much and I'm thrilled to participate to this program. Before preparing my presentation, I had the chance of watching many of the presentations that were delivered before and I hope that I will be able to provide a brief overview of the narratives of and for Europe that have characterized uh, Romania's past three decades. Um, some people would have chosen to uh, start this uh, chronology with uh, uh, some events during the communist times. Uh, Romania was, um, was the first country, the first socialist country that established diplomatic relations with the EC. Uh, but Romania was the first um, mm -hmm. um, socialist country, of course, outside the USSR, which established diplomatic relations with the Federal Republic of Germany. But this opening towards the West was very much uh, overshadowed and perhaps annihilated by the, by the 1980s when uh, the Nicolae Ceausescu's rule uh, became more and more um, totalitarian. So I chose to start with February the 1st, 1993. Of course, Romania has had a difficult transition. Has had a, it was a violent uh, change of regime. I tend not to use the term revolution. Uh, and all sorts of uh, interesting and um, difficult, difficult things happened and I will come back to them a little later. Uh, so, uh, Romania was a, was a laggard in terms of establishing relations with the West. For instance, it was the last socialist country, except for Albania. We always tend to, tend to, to forget Albania, which was admitted to the Council of Europe. And of course, it was uh, the last to uh, be, um, to establish normal relations with uh, uh, many important European powers, such as uh, Germany or the United Kingdom or even the United States. But anyway, February the 1st, 1993, meant the signing of uh, the Association Europa Agreement. Let me take a short break from this chronology for, for the Romanian transition, and I tend to uh, see Romania's, uh, Romania's European road uh, intertwined with the political transition. 1993 was a very important year because, as we know, major decisions are taken in Washington about, about NATO extension, enlargement. And moreover, more importantly, uh, the post-communist regime in Romania understands that there is no middle ground between East and West. What makes them understand that? Uh, the war in Yugoslavia, I would say, and the conflict in our neighboring country, Moldova. As most of you know, Moldova has been a part of uh, the, the current republic. M most of the territory of the current Republic of Moldova has been a part of, of Romania, of Romanian Moldova, and then of Romania. So it's deep insecurity. And the regime understands that it's time for European integration, European and NATO integration. This Du this duality between EU and NATO integration is specific, is, uh, is characteristic to Romania and perhaps to Poland and the Baltic states, maybe not to all of the new Eastern European members, but to Romania, Poland and the Baltic states, uh, security concerns are rather high. And of course, uh, afterwards, uh, come the membership application comes, the candidate status is granted in 1997, but, but in 1998 there was a debate which countries should be the first to be approached for enlargement negotiations, and Romania was not one of them. More advanced uh, Eastern European countries in terms of reforms were chosen. And uh, coupling that with the failure to get into the first NATO enlargement wave, it's a very difficult situation in terms of um, foreign and security policy for the Romanian government. Finally, we have 
the start of the accession negotiations following the Helsinki European Council, the regatta principle, everybody stands a chance, it's up to you to, to, to do it. And finally, EU accession. Now, of course, these are interesting points, but let's start with the inter interactions between political and economic transition and European integration. I would, I would say, for instance, I started studying political science in 1991. Uh, I'm the child of Maastricht and the <laughs> transition. So somehow for us in Romania and perhaps in other Eastern European countries, the idea of European integration, not knowing, no, not knowing exactly what it's like and what things are going to be like, was very much associated with political and economic transition. And uh, it was a huge... Um, focus point for mobilizing reform energies and for delegitimizing uh, former communist regime supporters. But anyway, um, we start with the bloody revolts. Um, we start with the National Salvation Front, which wants to be seen as a movement originating in civil society, perhaps like the Civic Forum or Public Against Violence in Czechoslovakia, but it's not. It's a political structure created by second and third rank communist party regimes. Uh, some dissidents which are associated quickly withdraw, some don't. And um, finally, the main opposition to, the, to that regime comes not from new civic parties like in Hungary or the Czech, Czechoslovakia, but from the older parties um, re-established, re-enacted like the National Liberal and National Peasants Party, Romanian interwar parties. The first three, but not fair elections, 1990. And of course, unfortunately, Romania is well known for uh, the miners' expeditions, violent expeditions uh, to Bucharest against the civic opposition or against the reform wing in the National Salvation Front. So this is, this is a bad starting field for European integration effort and, of course, for European narratives because we will go to that. Uh, a new constitution is adopted in December 1991, free and relatively fair elections in 1992. I told you that, for me, 1993 is a very, very significant year for, for Romania and uh, I would say, although integration hopes were low, um, the government understood and the political party supporting the government have understood that that is the direction to be taken. But this does not go very far. In terms of economic reforms, they are very much delayed and the reason that why they are delayed is, like in many other Eastern European countries, because um, well-positioned so well -positioned in social and uh, institutional terms, cliques, had to uh, gain the upper hand in terms of national asset distributions. So the process of privatization is fraught, but uh, um, eventually it, it happens. The opposition finally, finally gets in power in 1996. In the early 1990s, I would say there are some competing narratives uh, in terms of Romania and Europe, Romania, Europe. The back to Europe. The back to Europe, and I'm going here, is somehow politicized because the National Salvation Front, again, a successor party to the Communist Party, does not really want the back to Europe of the interwar years because that would have meant legitimizing its very opposition, National Liberal, National Peasants Party, the, uh, the, uh, the interwar parties, and monarchy. We have had a debate over the form of government in Romania much, much longer than any other uh, Eastern European country. Um, we can't really dwell on that, but it, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting theoretical question. Um, the prominent former dissidents and public intellectuals support back to Europe, but of course this is one of the main differences between Central Europe and Eastern Europe or Romania and Bulgaria, perhaps Albania and other countries which have lacked, have lacked uh, 
consistent movement and coherent movement uh, in terms of uh, political peaceful political opposition to the communist regime. Against this narrative, which is not confined to the democratic opposition, people in the government, in the National Salvation Front, and satellites and successors uh, share, may, some of them share a genuine feeling that, yeah, Europe is the destination. But we see in the early 1990s a process of uh, development uh, of another alternative, which does not challenge uh, the back to Europe uh, narrative directly. But this nationalism, anti Redentism. Of course, the issue of territories, our western border with Hungary, or restoring our interwar borders, which meant unification with the Republic of Moldova, and perhaps getting back some former Romanian territories from the Ukraine, were popular, and were popular again, uh, among people which were not communists or post-communists. They were somehow um, still uh, cherishing the, the interwar Romania, the greater Romania, and uh, that's why the nationalist camp is, uh, that does not really coincide with the former communist, former communist supporters. Mm -hmm. So this type of narrative is challenging the back to Europe narrative, uh, but not, it's not a frontal challenge. They would say, yes, we want, we should go back to Europe, but we should go the way history, uh, has uh, um, has made our destiny. So uh, uh, it's a sort of uh, it's a sort of uh, collateral uh, challenge. Of course, in practical political terms, these two these two narratives are um, are heading one against the other. And then, of course. We have, we have, um, is this um, strategic ploy, or is that a genuine belief that they should take us, take us as we are, Europe, they, Europe? Um, I don't know. I would say the latter. Uh, I would say that. Uh, it was, uh, it was a vision of Europe very much uh, enshrined in the past and uh, those people, most of those people did not really understand the way things were developing in the western part of the continent. Fortunately, um, that number has declined and currently we don't really have such a movement any longer. Um, as for many other Orthodox, majority Orthodox country, there was a debate about, about the Church and the potential opposition that the Orthodox Church might raise against uh, European integration. Fortunately, it was not the case and uh, the, the Romanian Orthodox Church has managed to consolidate a very stable hierarchy and its uh, front figures, especially the patriarchs, were genuine, genuinely interested in uh, interconfessional dialogue and in establishing relations with Europe. Why did it happen and why does the Romanian Orthodox Church uh, differ so much from the Bulgarian one or from the Serbian one and of course from the Russian one is an interesting issue. I can't dwell on that uh, now, but for instance, I had the pleasure uh, of seeing the Pope in, uh, on January the 1st in Yash, is the second papal visit uh, to Romania. Uh, in 1999, John Paul II was in Romania. Uh, now, uh, Francis was in Romania. So, um, the Orthodox, the, the institutional church um, did, not, did not oppose European integration, and that was important. Finally, the opposition comes to power, and uh, the economic results are disappointing and it's clear that they can't govern the country. And the new opposition, the former National Salvation Front, former communists, when they're in opposition, they backtrack. Their discourse is no longer pro-European, is no longer moderate. It's, uh, it's an anti-system. 
if you look at them in the op um, while being in the opposition, they are dissimilar, but they don't look like uh, the parties that used to govern uh, the, the previous legislature. It's populism, it's uh, uh, demagogical uh, stance. And of course, the miners come back, uh, but uh, they are finally defeated. We're talking about like a, like a civil war in, in Romania, bloodless, yes, but uh, nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, very, very serious in democratic terms. And we have ex-communists and nationalists winning again in 2000, just when the negotiations were about to take place. And of course, in the presidential elections in 2000, we have the Romanian Jean-Marie Le Pen, um, Cornelio Vadim Tudor, a nationalist, uh, who is soundly beaten by the former communist, Leon Iliescu. So it's a difficult choice in 2000. But anyway, what, what happened is that um, the new government carried the negotiations with a certain amount of competence and um, Romania was able to finish them, of course, with, uh, with many many outstanding issues. So uh, they were concluded with safeguard clo clauses. Uh, we had two judicial reform and fight against corruption. And it's the famous European conditionality. Now, I've been working a little bit on conditionality uh, during the past years in Romania or maybe in the Eastern Partnership countries, Moldova, Ukraine, and it's not working any longer. Uh, uh, conditionality should be uh, limited in time and um, the potential benefit should, uh, should be clear. Now for us, for any Romanian government, it's clear that there will be no political unanimity to admit Romania to the Schengen area and that's why conditionality is, uh, is, uh, has failed. And of course we may have seen that it's not such a big deal and that we can really travel and so this is, uh, this is not useful. The initiation of the MCV monitoring um, uh, cooperation and, ver and verification mechanism in terms of uh, judicial reform. Um, the reports were used to be uh, better and better until, until they got worse. And until the, we, had, uh, we had a major constitutional crisis in 2012 when there was a referendum in which uh, they tried to um, um, dismiss the, the president. And there are, let me put it mildly, there are many, many doubts about the accuracy of, uh, of, those, uh, of that referendum. But anyway, it had failed to reach the, uh, the turnout, the 50% turnout. Um, we don't really speak about the single currency. And there seems to be an overarching consensus that it's too early for for Romania and we are not so unhappy that major e uh, Eurogroup countries are not are opposing an eventual Romanian accession there. I, for instance, I am not unhappy at all because I think Romania should wait for much longer before, uh, before going into the European Monetary Union. But anyway, uh, in terms of convergence and in terms of meeting the criteria, uh, Romania used to fulfill the criteria some um, five years ago, maybe four years ago, but of course a new government came and uh, solved the question. Romania no longer meets the criteria for uh, ERM2. Um, one of the very interesting narratives of European integration, and somehow I told you about that, is uh, the fact that we, we, we see NATO and Europe, uh, EU, EU um, uh, development uh, as closely tied. So uh, European and Euro-Atlantic, we always tend to use this term. We are very weak. The Romanian government, but many people, I think the majority of the Romanian society, and myself included, we are very, very skeptical of the potential of a Europe solution, European solution for our, for our security. Although, although in terms of numbers and in terms of resources, Europe is very, very strong. It's more than capable of balancing against, against any other extra-European threat, to put it this way. Uh, this, is a, this is an important issue in Romania. 
And there, w there, were, there, there were some instances in which the government uh, did not know what to do. Or being a semi-presidential country, the president went in, into one direction and the government went into uh, the other direction. But uh, basically, basically, the security concerns uh, were always higher. So Romania went with the United States in Iraq. It's, it, uh, it's an example of supporting the United States and went with and sent troops there. And um, anyway, um, hopefully, hopefully, these things will, will be decided. The transatlantic relation will be will be decided one way or another. And turning to the current discourses, the current narratives, um, this multi-speed Europe annoys Romania. I, I wanted, I use their fear, but I think that um, I think it's um, more annoyed than, than afraid because somehow we, we, have got, we have gotten used to the peripheral position in, uh, in terms of European integration. We are happy with the market issues which, uh, which uh, have allowed Romania to develop. We are happy with the freedom of movement, of labor, of course, quite a lot of Romanians working in Europe. Um, we haven't been very vocal in terms of criticizing um, the promoters of the multi-speed Europe and of course because we are we have so such, such a connection with France it would be rather difficult to, to do it. Uh, but um, anyway, um, there is no Euroskeptical, and, and I come to, to, the important, uh, to the important issue of Euroskepticism. Uh, first of all, in societal terms, the, uh, there is a high confidence in European institutions. And of course, it's much higher than in, uh, than in Romanian political institutions. The government and the parliament and the Romanian political parties score very low. But... Uh, mm, I talk to many colleagues and say, "How come that you don't have, you don't have genuinely <coughs> Eurosceptic parties?" And one answer would be because the existing parties are very good at, at integrating at their margins Eurosceptic voters, and the second one would be that the issue of European funds is so important for Romania that the idea of pulling out or somehow turning our back to the uh, European Union is not very popular and. If it's popular among, let me say, a very uh, ideolo ideologized, mobilized segment, it's not popular among your mayors or, or your heads of district councils which want European money to finance various, various projects. And, uh, of course, we've had elections, <coughs> but... Uh, before the election, the, the elections and the referendum, I'll, I'll turn back to it a little, a little later, and I'm approaching the end of my presentation. Uh, European issues are not salient on, uh, on our agenda. For instance, as a journalist, I tend to write on both domestic, international, and European politics. There's a huge gap between the hits uh, when I write, write about domestic or international politics, something like the US and so on, and what about the Spitzenkandidat and and uh, so on. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, interest does not really mean ignorance, I guess, because in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, freedom of movement and people traveling and people going to work, I think it's about social knowledge, and social knowledge proceeds slowly. Uh, we are sometimes uh, picky about our image in the West and in the European Union and there is a high public sensitivity over the performance or misperformance of, uh, of Romanians in the EU institutions. Um, there was a huge debate about the way uh, Romania would run the council. The opposition said you'll make a mess of ourselves, of yourselves. The government said no, we'll do it properly. We'll see about that. Uh, there is a, somehow a consensus that consensus that it was not a disaster and uh, this means that the uh, senior bureaucrats and uh, the experts in the in the ministries have really done their, their job. Um, 
we have some issues with the uh, European Commission intervention and of course European institutions interventions in matters of rule of law and um, that have been that has been uh, a major political topic and somehow somehow the European elections and the referendum solved it it's clear that it's clear that the majority of the of the Romanian people uh, have supported uh, political parties which do not uh, do not plead for take, take us as we are or do not try to use the libertarian message uh, to which uh, I, uh, <laughs> I have a full respect to justify uh, curbing the powers of the prosecutors to, to, uh, to prosecute to, uh, to indict uh, politicians so uh, this <coughs> is not libertarianism in, in my view um, and uh, the, the warnings, the interventions of, uh, of, the European, uh, of the European institutions have somehow, have somehow um, influenced uh, a, certain, um, a certain segment of voters. Well, I, I have to see figures and about, uh, about uh, the elections and the referendum to give a proper answer to that. Um, the high turnout does not really mean anything because the referendum was the main drive uh, for for turnout. It's almost half of the electorate turned. <coughs> it's forty percent and something. Uh, it's a it's a strong it's a strong turnout for for European elections in in Romania. But they were people were invited to vote in a referendum, which uh, had some um, one one of the questions was flawed. Would you agree that pardon should be banned for corruption, corruption issues? I don't really see why you would allow pardon for murder or I don't know what other uh, crime and uh, uh, ban it for corruption. And another one was a very complicated question, long and complicated. But the point is, you ask the people what you want and the people always, the electorate always answers what he wants, what they want. So they wanted to say uh, enough with corruption, and uh, that's uh, that's the reason why the results were uh, were very pretty awful for the governing party, which is parties which are associated with stopping the anti-corruption uh, struggle. So I think that the idea of we belong is is uh, is uh, suitable or describing societies, uh, society, society's response to uh, European integration. We belong. We will see what happens. We will learn how to uh, make use of uh, all sorts of instruments the European Union puts at our disposal, of, our, of European funds, of European other, other European instruments. Uh, but we want to be there. And yes, we understand that we have to, to a certain extent, extent to behave uh, like we should. Thank you very much. <laughs>